In the West Midlands, in the picturesque medieval market town of Shrewsbury, the ancient faith of the British Isles has been revived. Here we see the Byzantine liturgy being celebrated in English, in a church whose history tells the story of the religious life of the nation. In fact, this unassuming little church is perhaps the oldest religious site still in use in the British Isles. Now in the hands of the Orthodox, the church has returned to its original Christian heritage. We first saw this church in 1991 when it was a farmer's stall with the holes in the roof and it was really very grotty and the, the walls were black. We bought it in 1994 and we started using it straight away. When the church was consecrated in 1997, so the Archbishop came to consecrate it, I think we may have had one icon, maybe two, and the rest were, were just gaps. It was a Saxon church, a big Saxon church, probably dating, I think, from somewhere before 700, um, in its origins anyway. And there must have been something very special here that people came to because it was so big. Because Anglo-Saxon churches are not big usually, they're small little churches. What it was, I don't know. But it is on a, a pagan site because when we had the archaeology done, we discovered a post, about sort of that size, um, out there. And we then discovered that there had been other posts found, the far side, so it stands in the middle of this arrangement of posts which date to 2033 BC. So it was a ritual, a pagan ritual site that has been Christianized, turned into a Christian church, and it is still in use. So it has been a place of worship for people in Britain for 4,000 years. Maybe longer, who knows? The thriving multi-ethnic parish community has attracted many converts. One of the pillars of the community is the New Zealand-born iconographer, artist and writer Aidan Hart, whose work has received international acclaim both within and beyond the Orthodox world. As a public persona and proponent of the arts, his continued presence through BBC interviews, his involvement with the Prince of Wales Trust and his numerous writings have introduced countless people through the sacredness of art to a life with God. So many people have come to Christ and come to the Orthodox Church through beauty. That's not the prime, prime function of liturgical art. The prime function is just to worship God. But we want to do the best we can so it becomes beautiful. But one fruit of this is to create a holy fragrance. Beauty, I see as... Um, the fragrance of a beautiful flower that attracts people initially through the fragrance, but then they want to find out where does this fragrance come from. So they, they come to church, they see the beauty, and then if their hearts are open, they ask, well, where does this beauty come from? This is a, another type of beauty. It's a transparent beauty, a beauty that doesn't say, just look at me, but says, look through me, look to the source of my beauty. There's a humility about liturgical art. So for me, liturgical art is all sorts of things. It's, um, it's a combination, it's a reason why we live so we can worship God. It's um, the outflowing of the church's life into the world through beauty. It's uh, a vision. Uh, one of the prophets said, without vision, the people perish. And I think, to finish, in our world, Things are going astray uh, in the world because we have no vision. If you don't worship God, if, 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 if God is not at the heart of things, you run around looking for satisfaction and you create 
things to try to fill that void. But in the end, it's, it's distraction rather than um, the truth. It might touch the hem of truth, but it will only be partial. The liturgical art, I think, if we want to return health to the world, we've got to start there. A trained liturgical artists, not just in the skills, but in a life of holiness. Yeah. A lot of art schools, most don't teach the techniques of, of how to create beauty, be it music or visual. So sadly, we, we've got to start from scratch, really, to improve liturgical art. Aidan Hart's work demonstrates how we can produce a relevant local modern art, which at the same time is highly personal and yet does not betray tradition. When you think of the Orthodox Church, most people think of Greece or Russia. But Britain was Orthodox the first thousand years before the schism. So I wanted to do something that was related to, to Britain. So in this particular case, I, mean, I made the image up, but it was inspired by particularly what's called the Berry St. Edmund Gospel. It's um, a scripture written in various St. Edmunds in about 1150, I think, illuminated manuscripts. So I drew ideas from that as I wanted it to be something that our, our Cypriot and Russian brethren could identify. Think, yeah, that's an icon. But also British people would say, actually, that looks a bit Romanesque. Yeah. So this is from the Romanesque period. From its very beginnings, the Christian tradition has established and sustained itself along two paths the life of the parish and the life of the monastery. England's landscape was once peppered with countless thriving monasteries, eradicated through Protestantism and further neglected in secular modernity. Recent years have witnessed a re-emergence of the ancient monastic tradition on British soil with several burgeoning monasteries, one of which is located just outside of Shrewsbury. Here is Father Philip, the abbot of the monastery of St. Anthony and St. Cuthbert. Now it's really important for people like me and anybody else in this country who's enthusiastic and interested in orthodoxy and the mission of God here to realize that we're not the first people here. Not the first orthodox Christians here at all. Not by a very long chalk. We have an enormous number of previous witnesses of the resurrection, both the resurrection itself, so for example, it's rumored that St. Paul came here, uh, St. Simon Zelotes, St. Andrew, possibly St. Jude, and one or two of the other apostles as well. Why did they want to come? Well, they came because these islands were known as the ends of the earth. And when the Lord said, start in Jerusalem, go on to Samaria, then carry on to the ends of the earth, he probably had just where I'm sitting in mind. Particularly after the Reformation, Christianity in these islands has become more and more diminished. To now, at this point, very, very few people go anywhere near a church over the entirety of their lives. Hardly anybody is baptized in any of the denominations. Increasingly, people are not even buried by the churches. And largely, people are not getting married, let alone getting married inside a church. So Christianity, in a real sense, has died in this place. So the mission that we're doing is definitely mission from almost nothing. One of the big things that those people involved in mission here have to remember is we're not bringing it here for the first time. The entire country is soaked with the blood of martyrs. For instance, in Lincolnshire alone, in one small valley next to the river with them, 300 people were martyred by the Danes on one afternoon. And that whole area still seeped with the blood and the prayers of those martyrs of Bardney. We're in Crowland, where 78 people were killed in one day. And then a few days, a few months later, St. Thurkettle, having started the monastery up again, uh, he was then killed during the autumn of the same year, again by the Danes. Or all, all those people who were put to death uh, throughout the time of the um, conquest by the Normans, because they had maintained the old faith despite the schism. 
Now those are the people whose prayers guide and help us even now. Without a doubt, a growing interest has been kindled in the British Isles to return to the roots of its Christian Orthodox heritage. But still there is an overwhelming lack of knowledge about this legacy. Considering the global significance and near ubiquity of the English language, the re-Christianization of Britain should be of prime importance to the international Orthodox community. For Saint Arsenius of Cappadocia, who said that the church in these islands, and there are hundreds of islands in Britain, would begin to grow when the Orthodox Church began to venerate the saints of these islands. As the liturgy is the heart of the Orthodox experience, its celebration in its full grandeur is the living embodiment of the faith, sustaining those already present within it and attracting others through its holy fragrance. After a break with the tradition for nearly 1,000 years, the growing Orthodox communities on British soil require education in the liturgical arts. Liturgical art, I think if we want to return health to the world, we've got to start there. Train liturgical artists, not just in the skills, but in a life of holiness. Uh, a lot of art schools, most don't teach the techniques of, of how to create beauty, be it music or visual. So sadly, we, we've got to start from scratch really to improve liturgical art. We've got to train people with these skills that they might otherwise have got in in, um, in secular institutions, but also the theology, the whole meaning of liturgical art. We have a great task ahead of us, but um, we live in exciting times. It's a wonderful time in the Orthodox Church. For those of us who've lived through the last third of a century or more in the Orthodox Church, it's been quite a tough time. But I think that people will look back on this as our golden age, the golden age of the Orthodox Church in these islands. And from that point of view, it could hardly be more exciting. In the very heart of Shrewsbury, we have now acquired the use of one of its great historical buildings. The Church of St. Julian's dates back to before the Schism. Originally consecrated in honor of St. Juliana of Nicomedia, the space will serve as a center for liturgical art and culture with a fully accredited seminary. And it will also function as a performance venue for internationally renowned artists from across the globe. Courses, workshops, master classes, theater, an audiovisual studio, and a fully fledged language institute and music academy. In honor of the church's original patron saint, this institute will be known as the Academy of St. Juliana. Here we are in the centre of Shrewsbury, which is a border town. It is the centre for people to get here from Manchester, from Liverpool, from Birmingham, from Cardiff. It's a very easy place to get to. Somehow or other we discovered we had bought an incredibly ancient church, which was Orthodox originally. It's the only church in Britain that is in origin an Orthodox church that has come back to us. So there's a lot of potential here, and because it is so easy to get here, this is unquestionably a very good place to get things going. So with mission, we're not by ourselves. With mission we have the relics of the saints. With mission we have all the saints who have come before us. With mission we have Christ himself urging us on, promising to be with us to the end of the age. And also giving us that great commission to go to the ends of the earth. And that means right here.
in order to bring people to him. So pray for us doing that. Thank you. Oh